Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. And this is my first lecture for my Philosophy of Mind course on connectionism. We've been uh, recently learning about functionalism, and we have uh, learned some basic neuroscience about uh, neural networks and uh, some of the philosophical issues surrounding um, understanding the connection between minds and brains. And um, connectionism is going to give us a theoretical bridge that will connect up what we've learned about neurons to um, what's possible with building uh, systems that may be conscious. Okay, so what are some of those lessons? Uh, a bit of review from what we talked about last time. Um, a neuron, we're going to understand at sort of the abstract level, is a simple triggering unit. It's a very dumb little mechanism that's embedded in a network of other trigger units just like it. A neuron receives thousands of signals simultaneously or in parallel all at once from its dendrite side, and then it sends signals out to other neurons on its axon side. So it's got this shape of getting uh, simultaneous signals in parallel on one side and sending out a signal after it sort of processes or um, uh, conjoins all of those signals that come in, and it, and it does a con sort of conversion function on those signals and sends them out the other side. That's going to be important for us to build artificial neural networks. Uh, it needs a signal that adds up to its activation threshold um, in order to fire, so it has to have a signal that has a certain uh, a cumulative strength, and the strength of the output signal that it sends out, its axon side, is scaled um, to the cumulative strength of its input. So if it gets more input of a certain sort from its dendrite side, that results in the, um, the quality or the strength of the signal that it sends out its other side. That's going to be important because we want to try to mimic or represent that kind of structure, information processing structure in artificial neural networks. Past firing patterns, we learned, establish weights to the connections that either amplify or inhibit the incoming signal. Um, so one of the other ways to understand long-term potentiation or this slogan that neurons that fire together wire together is that um, the connections uh, between dendrites and axons have weights to them. Uh, understanding this inhibitory or excitatory effect means, uh, look, when I said before that if neuron A fires a lot and triggers B very often, then B gets very receptive to or very eager or very... Um, uh, receptive to getting signals from A. It listens to A. It um, uh, it triggers more readily in response to A's firing than some other uh, some other pattern. You know, and that's you hearing something that doesn't sound right to you and thinking that doesn't sound right. It doesn't fit. It doesn't sort of go along with the, what I know. And what happens at the neural side is that there's an inhibitory uh, feature here that when um, some new associated, associated connection is being made, that's not familiar to you and there's not the sort of amplificatory um, uh, response through those neural nets, whereas um, others do, uh, it, it has a well-worn groove and it does naturally and readily move through these other sort of receptive fields. Okay, so these connection weights, they change over time. That is, the, the propensity to fire or inhibit a signal coming from some other neuron um, goes up and down, and that's learning. That's you getting better at your backhand in tennis or you getting better at calculus. Um, that's long-term potentiation. Um, and that's the, the slogan that neurons that fire together wire together. So that's how it works in the details. Okay, so now zoom up to the network scale. Um, what happens when you start putting uh, groupings of these together? Um, this thing becomes what's known as a parallel distributed processor. That's going to be importantly different to serial processing, which we're going to look at in just a minute. Um, signals, such as from the sensory periphery, like I'm getting signals from my eyes, from my ears, from my um, skin, from my touch, all at once. They cascade in from the sensory periphery, and they simultaneously move across these cortical layer neurons in the brain. Processing at the, at the individual neuron level, at least, appears to be sub-symbolic. That is, even though we employ symbols, words, and concepts to refer to objects, so at the conscious level, I can talk about objects and use words like black or tall or uh, heavy. Um, those symbols, those concepts, those um, 
rich representations that I'm using at this level don't map cleanly down to the processors at the neural level that produce them. So it's not as if we can do a kind of one-to-one -one mapping down to find the black neuron or the tall neuron or the heavy neuron from which that signal came from. It doesn't work like that. Um, concepts get diffused. They get some symbolic down at the processing level. Uh, in, in neurons. Some processing is feed forward, so that's the sort of uh, pattern that I've been describing um, where the network goes from one node to the next node to the next node cascading across the network um, and out into other regions of the brain, um, but some processing is actually back propagated. So here's another lesson, we didn't talk about this before, but sometimes a, neur the, a neural chain will loop back onto itself so that you get a signal that's actually feeding um, out from the network and back into the network and that turns out to be important for modifying or adjusting or modulating those signals that are coming out and it's used as a kind of what well, they call it back propagation but it's um, it's a way to uh, regulate and temper um, the outputs of the system it's a it's a way of listening to what you're outputting and then changing what you're outputting in response to the listening okay so let me introduce um, a, an important distinction if we're going to talk about artificial neural networks, we need to talk about good old-fashioned artificial intelligence. So that's what GoFi stands for. Um, and this is probably the kind of artificial intelligence or com com computational work you're most familiar with. Um, think of lines of code, like I've got down in the bottom left corner here. Or think of it like a simple calculator that's just doing serial, deterministic, rigid, narrow, task-specific um, functions that are hard-coded into the system. Um, it's been uh, programmed to do certain functions and it does them one at a time. It's deterministic, which means um, it's locked. Um, it's narrow, it's task specific, it doesn't have any flexibility, and it only does exactly what it was programmed to do. That's good old-fashioned artificial intelligence. And it turns out that AI has changed a lot in the last 20 years, as you may know. Um, and the new version, the new account, or the new story here is that um, uh, is, is is that we're, what we're doing now in many cases is building artificial neural networks. So they don't operate the way good old-fashioned artificial intelligence did. Um, these are networks that are modeled after human neural systems. So they've got activation weights across a network. There's a gradient of, um, of responses that can happen uh, across these um, artificial neural gaps. Um, that amplifier suppress. They have uh, the activation nodes are probabilistic, and so on. And I'm going to explain all these terms here in just a minute. I've got, a, I've got more or less a slide dedicated to each one of these differences. So old school, um, good old fashioned AI um, used to sort of emerge out of computational theory of mind, but now we've got a, a new wave a connectionist theory of mind that's giving us a different account of how. Um, minds are built out of brains, and these artificial neural systems are modeling some of what we think are the most important features of, uh, of organic neural networks and mimicking those, and that's partly what's been responsible for producing this amazing revolution in the last 10 or 20 years in um, computational power in the kind of systems that we can build and the things that they can do, many of which you can do with your phone now. Um, that simply couldn't have been done before on the old approach. Okay, so let's talk about those. Artificial neural networks mimic some of the structural features of, of real organic neural networks mathematically. So they do it not with sodium and potassium ions, but with number signals. Um, but the abstract, at the abstract level, they do it the same. They, they're doing what we think is that they're doing it the same. They're, they're, they're um, alike enough in the right sorts of ways and they're mimicking the right parts of neural function that it would be appropriate to think of them as a neural network and perhaps um, at some stage if we get these things uh, developed enough we can imagine them being conscious. Um, nodes in an artificial neural network receive inputs that have signals of varying strength. So this thing, uh, the picture down here on the right, um, is lifted out of the Stufflebeam uh, reading for class that um, I gave you three readings on connectionism. Uh, so you need to go through and look at his animations and look at his uh, exercises and his uh, um, uh, discussion and he'll explain how the thing works. But you've got a node that's getting inputs from lots of other um, 
other nodes, and then it, it has an activation function that's mathematical, and it waits to get a certain level of, of input, and then it gives an output of a certain sort, and it has um, uh, inhibitory, it amplifies or inhibits those signals that it sends out. Uh, training changes the connection weights so that artificial neural networks are said to learn the way neural networks do. Processing is sub-symbolic, like it is with neurons. Um, networks learn that as a back propagation algorithm modifies the weights of the nodes in the network up or down to improve the performance at the output layer. Um, so uh, I didn't do it in this discussion, but Stufflebeam's got a great animation where you can actually see the um, the see the connection weight and see the signal coming in, and you can calculate whether or not the activation threshold for the node has been um, reached. It's a very simple sort of math multiplication function. You you multiply the um, the the weight by the signal, and then you add all those together, and you see if see whether or not the node has met its activation potential. So it's um, very simple. Um, <clears throat> okay, so some terms, and you've heard some of these terms, but we need to introduce them in order to be able to talk about what's going on here. Um, artificial neural networks have an input layer, which is um, like the sensory periphery. It's where the the signal that's going to be uh, uh, processed comes in. Uh, it has an output layer, which is where the answer comes out, and the hidden units are the layers that are in between the inputs and the outputs. So it sounds a bit like functionalism in some ways. Um, loss is a term that often gets used here to talk about the difference between the actual output and the correct output. output. And the idea is that artificial neural networks, they learn. Um, we, you know, build one of these in a uh, graduate uh, seminar on, um, uh, uh, on AI, and then we gather up uh, millions of pictures off the internet of cats and millions of pictures of non-cats, and then we feed them through the network, and we want the thing to get good at recognizing cats. So we use an algorithm that every time this, this uh, system outputs the wrong answer to the question, is this a cat, the algorithm then goes back and changes some of the weights. And the loss is the measurement of the difference between um, what, it, uh, what it did and what it should have done. And that's how we use uh, back propagation to adjust and train the thing to make it better. And what happens is that um, some of these really simple networks actually get uh, much better than humans at doing some of these uh, visual recognition tasks or some of these other sort of cognitive tasks, um, problems which hadn't been solved for decades in computer science. Um, machine learning is this process of using algorithms to adjust those connection weights in uh, an ANM. And deep learning is when we use these massive data sets, often from the internet, to make it possible to train networks with thousands or millions of examples. It's, it's this massive amounts of parallel processing power um, and massive numbers of data set, huge data sets that enable us to um, uh, train them up and get such good performance out of them. Uh, so it's very different than the old approach uh, to sort of hard coding a calculator to be able to deal with a math problem, for instance. Back propagation in computer science is used as an algorithm that's used to train and to adjust the weights, and it works the same way in principle that it does in the uh, brain case or in the neurons case. And supervised training is a case where you've got input data sets that are labeled and then they're checked against the outputs. So in the case I just described, for instance, um, you can uh, prior to training, have two piles of pictures, one pile that you label as cats and one pile you label as non-cats, and then you use the labels to supervise and to modify and to tune uh, the system to make it better and better at recognizing cats. Um, an unsupervised training data set would be one that doesn't hasn't label cats and not cats. You just feed the pictures in and then uh, keep adjusting the thing um, when it gets the wrong answer um, and just have it keep training, and it figures out what um, uh, which are cats and which are not, um, uh, just by the the uh, algorithm that keeps changing the weights. So un unsupervised data training is input data sets are not labeled. Uh, okay, so let me separate out some of these concepts. On the old school view, on the way you may sort of think about AI systems or computer systems, they're serial processors. That means that operations are performed one at a time on a token or a, a sort of piece of, uh, of information. And complex tokens are built up from code. 
And then tokens and operations are legally defined as operations from the program. So uh, the program gets a keystroke. Um, and that keystroke is a token that now has to be dealt with by the code in the program. That's what I mean by serial. It deals with that, or the code deals with each input one at a time and, in a, in, and it does one operation at a time. Uh, by contrast, modern ANN systems are parallel. At the input or sensory la layer, undifferentiated gradient stimuli, so different levels of light or different levels of dark or, or um, different levels of quality uh, are received simultaneously um, all at once, just like it is on you at the input layer, and then passed through the nodes and filtered by the activation weights that amplify or suppress. So it's not, um, it's, it's sort of a, a holistic uh, encounter with the, uh, the object of sensation. And I'll show you some examples in a second. Okay, so uh, furthermore, uh, GoFi systems deal atomically with a token, with a symbol, or with a thing, uh, a piece of information in the system, and those are the units that get moved through the economy of the code or of the uh, programming, whereas um, modern systems are distributed. Machine learning results in a set of weighted nodes that reflect training only at the output layer. Abilities emerge, but no clear analogs in the hidden layers. So you might build a system that's very good at recognizing the letter A, the handwritten letter A, but there's nothing down inside that maps directly back up to um, parts of the A or anything. Not the way um, some of the old school processing did, where we tried to put sentences together out of words and that sort of thing. So uh, processing is distributed and sub-symbolic. Um, Old school GoFi systems are deterministic. The state of the token is fixed. The operations are legal. Then changed tokens are stored, read, passed on to future operations. That's the way you know programming works. Every state of the machine, the program, the token is discrete, fixed, and predictable at every le level. So this feeds into some of people's intuitions about robots or about machines being sort of um, on a lockstep deterministic path. Um, that their initial state determines their output state. Uh, modern ANN systems are not like that. They're not built that way. They're not trained that way. And their states and um, uh, procedures are more under, better understood as probabilistic. Uh, activation weights are a gradient. So there's a variety. Uh, you know, imagine that for a region of the screen, we could assign a value of it, um, a grayscale value from light to dark between one and zero, right? So that's a, a bit of information that's coming in from that region of the screen. Um, so it's like your uh, apprehension of the world is in, is in terms of gradients too. You see gradients of color. Um, you have gradients of hardness that you feel when you press harder with your hands or objects have um, sort of gradient uh, um, differences across their uh, surfaces. States. The, uh, so furthermore, uh, for an ANN, the states inside are not fixed, um, and the outputs are, they might be predictable, but the outputs are probabilistic at best. Um, we can make some good guesses. Or what happens is, um, this system gets to be 87% accurate at identifying cat pictures from the web which might be better than a human is, right? It means 13% of the time it gets it wrong still, but what we're doing is trying to squeeze out little bits of improved performance. Uh, okay, so as I've hinted, GoFi systems are programmed, so all tasks, all knowledge, all capacities, all operations are defined beforehand by the programmers. They're scripted and they're anticipated in the code. Everything that that system can do is already built into it. ANN systems, the modern um, artificial neural network systems are not like that. These systems are blank at the start. They're empty. The weights get set to random values, and then you just train them up, and the algorithms train on the basis of large data sets. They don't know anything before they start, and then you train them on experience, and they get better and better by, by degrees at doing what they do. Um, but it's not sort of hard step locked in programmed the way the old school uh, systems were. Uh, furthermore, in an old school GoFi system, if there's a failure, if there's a problem, if there's a mistake, if there's a glitch in the code, um, that results in a catastrophic failure. Problems in the code, faulty inputs, errors result in failure and no output. The thing just shuts down, right? The blue screen of death. 
uh, whereas with modern ANN systems, they exhibit a property that's present in um, human neural systems, and they call it graceful degradation. Since the capacities are widely distributed across the network, problems with a node or even multiple nodes result in gradual degradation of, perfor of performance. So what will happen is, um, if you remove a node or you change the values on a particular node within the network, um, you'll get a perhaps probabilistic decrease or decay in performance at the output layer. You don't get the thing to shut down and not be able to function. You just get it to be a little bit less good um, than it was before at a particular task. And that, it turns out, is the way that human brains work. That small damage or stroke damage or damage in one area doesn't completely, uh, maybe, doesn't completely stop function. Um, but you get this graceful, more graceful degradation rather than abrupt uh, catastrophic failure. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> GoFi systems are brittle. If inputs don't match exactly, if it doesn't get the, exactly the right sort of input, um, if there's noise, if the signal's incomplete, or if it's degraded, then the thing just can't function. It doesn't know what to do with um, a partial or messy or noisy signal. Um, whereas uh, ANN systems are actually good at pattern completion. They can anticipate what's coming. Um, they can deal with noisy or incomplete signals and still generate the correct output. Um, so I'm going to show you just a minute of some uh, visualization here um, on the video. And what this is, is it's a, a visual representation of, at the input layer, um, a, a famous hard task, um, reading handwriting. Turns out it's very hard to build a computer that can do what you do pretty well, which is read handwriting. I can write out a 9, or your mother can write out a 9, or your brother can write out a 9, and you'll recognize of all of us that we all wrote out a 9. But where handwriting is different and, import, and importantly different in details and how it is actually shaped on the page. Um, turns out ANN systems are very good at this task. And what this shows is a number of different architectures for ANN systems and, and sort of gives a, a visual representation of at the input side different handwriting of different uh, numbers, one, zero through nine. And then on the output side, it identifies whether it just got a, a look at a zero, a one, a two, a three, or four, or a nine. Uh, so you can see here, Can't mute the thing. So there on the input layer are the different handwritten numbers. And the signals from the, perc from the perception cascade through the network and go through all of these nodes. Now, these have been trained on many, many cases to get them good at doing this. And on the output side, then the thing says it makes a call. It makes a judgment. Is this a 6? Is it a 7? Is it a 9? And it registers um, from the handwriting whether or not it's one of those things. And the suggestion here is that maybe this is just a interesting uh, visual recognition task. But what I'd like to suggest is, and I think what connectionists are excited about, is that there's something about this or get more organic looking process that resembles something like human concept formation or concept application. Here, this thing is correctly categorizing um, very different handwriting inputs as their correct uh, number outputs. That is, it's applying a concept of a sort. It's able to um, recognize three in its various different disguises, uh, but the abstract general concept three is being correctly identified in lots of other various different uh, real world cases. Now, um, what's, what's being shown here are some different um, more complicated uh, architectural um, uh, arrangements of uh, neural networks. So for our purposes, it won't be important. Um, this just visualizes different ways to do the same process. All right, so you get an idea, at least, about the, the sort of um, the radical difference between uh, ANN systems and GoFi systems. Um, and and the it, part of the excitement, I think, and a part of what um, people in cognitive science are um, 
uh, are thinking is that this uh, uh, shift over to modeling neural networks is opening the door to us making this huge progress in figuring out um, some really essential aspects of the way human minds work. Um, and that when you go to parallel distributed processing of this sort, and you go to network processing, and you adopt or you mimic some of these mathematical features of neural networks, you actually carry over and capture some of the really important philosophical features of the system that makes it successful at maybe applying concepts or about building out other uh, more impressive cognitive abilities. Um, historically, as I've suggested, visual recognition tasks have been extremely hard for GoFi systems. They just break down if you try to show them uh, handwritten numbers, for example. Um, a and n systems frequently exceed human ability um, on these visual recognition tasks. Uh, so at the bottom there are some examples of uh, uh, artificial AI systems that actually do better at recognizing x-rays than human radiologists do. Um, they've been used to recognize different kinds of skin lesions where they can actually perform better than human dermatologists. And on the far right, I've got a picture of uh, an AI system that does a very good job of assigning with the probability whether it's seen a dog, a car, a horse, or a person. It's correctly identifying objects in the scene. And we've already talked about the handwriting problem. You can see there's a bunch of different examples of threes. Look at all the threes in that list and look at how actually different they are at the pixel level. Um, and a &N systems are very good um, at dealing with those kinds of tasks. That's very suggestive about building up some other more compounded um, cognitive abilities. Okay, so it looks like PDP, which stands for Parallel Distributed Processing Networks, have new abilities. It looks like they represent even though no structures or patterns here that map onto logical relationships or semantic content and sentences, they, representation is distributed and sub-symbolic. Um, it's hard to see where three is inside that system, but clearly the inputs and the outputs suggest that this thing is capturing the essence of three, but it's doing it at a sub-symbolic level. There's not some three... Um, uh, that, that, that we can look at inside the network, uh, but we can see that the thing outputs the answer, correct answer, that, 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 it looked at, that it's looked at a three. Uh, so it looks like properties and abilities are emergent, very much like they are in human brains. And um, one of the reasons for excitement here is that connectionist network capacities um, seem to more closely resemble human conceptual abilities in some of these ways. It looks like it's very promising. GoFi systems were hand programmed and only able to do exact matching, and that's why they sucked at that kind of process. Um, um, that shouldn't say CN, it should say artificial neural networks or a new AI systems are trained and they learn from experience, which is also the way we do it. Uh, the connection strengths can change, so system performance grows and it's adaptive, and that's the way human brains work. Um, so now you will recall Leibniz's mill problem, which I've been talking about for a few lectures now. Um, Leibniz was worried or didn't understand or denied that a mere mechanism could produce the heights of beautiful poetry or, you know, bridge the gap from uh, the pushing and pulling inside the mill to something as uh, different in kind and character as a thought or an idea. Uh, but it looks like, again, it looks like we're closing the gap here. We're, we're um, uh, connectionist research. Um, modern AI research uh, suggests, uh, there's a lot of controversy here in the background that I'm sort of glossing over, but it suggests that um, we're figuring out how to bridge those gaps from uh, the mechanism to these uh, more abstract conceptual abilities. Okay, a few more points. The presumption in cognitive science for decades has been that the deep functional structure of cognitive systems, both human and non-human, must reflect the semantic and syntactic relationships of knowledge, belief, and logical inference. Okay, so you'll see, for instance, what I mean by all that is, look over there at that diagram. So we've got relationships between dogs and cats. Dogs and cats both have paws on the left and they both have fur. 
and they're both related by the have function. So cats have paws is a uh, modular connection of ideas. A cat is an object with properties, and paws are a thing, and this system, the GoFi system, would attribute paws to cats, and it would also attribute paws to dogs, uh, but it would do so in different ways, and they have logical relationships. So we'd say, uh, dogs have paws, but snakes do not have paws. Cats have paws. Um, also, uh, porpoises don't have paws, uh, but porpoises are not snakes. So there's sort of simple logical relationships about categories, about objects in the categories, and the properties they have and the properties they don't have. That's what I mean by semantic and syntactic relationships and logical inference that connects the two. Um, it was thought on GoFi systems or GoFi approach that any system that could do what humans do would have to have the structures or patterns, the program features that mimic and map onto the symbolic relationships down inside the system. So if, look, if you can do this thing of process dogs and cats and paws and not paws, then there's got to be something um, some analog, some structural modular analog to dog and cat and paws or the logical relationship you're doing that's built in down inside the system. That was the way we used to think about it. Uh, in the modern approach, modern AI systems, um, their approach has been, and this is typified by, say, uh, Jan LeCun, who's at Google, no, he's at Facebook, um, the idea is how much thought can be learned from experience with a little, little or no structure, little or no innate or a priori, a priori knowledge or logical structure built into the system through mere association, through training, um, through uh, experience. Uh, that's the idea. That's the inspiration behind AI systems, uh, modern AI systems. Okay, so to expand this idea, the GoFi approach used to adopt something that they called the language of thought um, uh, approach. And the idea here is that thinking occurs and must occur in a kind of mental language. That if, um, if a Japanese speaker says that cats have paws and an English speaker says that cats have paws, there must be some sort of sub-language. They called it kind of jokingly mentalese that... Um, that allows both the Japanese and the English speaker to be processing the same objects and the same properties. And Japanese and English are different on the surface, but underneath there's a common language-like structure that's built inside that allows for subjects and verbs and objects and properties and logical relationships. Um, so that's the language of thought approach. And the idea used to be that simple concepts can be combined in semantic a systematic rule governed ways. So you connect up paws to cats, and when you connect up paws to porpoises, you say, well, porpoises don't have paws. So you add the logic, the negation relation. Um, and it was thought that all of that had to been sort of modular and hard sort of constructed in, into the system. So on this view, thinking at its deepest level has a syntax rule governed structure, uh, one that mimics the way we uh, think that's built down hardwired inside. And these views were also what they call a priori views or nativist views. Um, and this is really referring to more to Noam Chomsky. Uh, so Jerry Fodor and Noam Chomsky are sort of famous proponents of this view. Um, but Chomsky is famous for arguing that humans have a deep structured grammar that's built in that enables logic and object representation and relationship parsing and property recognition. So they are sort of typify that approach. And the idea was that there are there, there's more or less a prioriist people in these fields. Um, and this old school approach was much more a priori or nativist. Um, the new school approach dispenses with all of that. And what I mean by a priori here is that it's prior to experience, that before you uh, take your AI system out and point it at objects in the world, you've got to build um, capacities, build uh, conceptual structure, build logic, uh, build stuff into it um, prior. Um, uh, and this maps onto the way philosophers have talked about a priori versus a posteriori knowledge um, for centuries. Uh, so the a priorist folks were ones who were, were more inclined to say all of this work is be, has to be done on the front side before you can send um, you know, a, a functioning AI system out of the world. 
Um, so the modern or the, the more recent approach, the connectionist approach, uh, says, look, the mind is more like a blank slate, this old debate, right? Um, experience writes onto it, and then we acquire knowledge more just with association. philosophical history, and you've got people like Kant and Hume arguing over how much of the mind has to be built in a priori, how much structure has to be put in there to make it possible to have this, this, this agent go out into the world and be able to recognize that there's permanent, contiguous objects out there that have causal relationships to each other. You know, uh, um, uh, there's a there's a there's an amazing amazing amount of cognitive work that a toddler can do when they know that if you pull the block out of the bottom of the tower the tower is going to fall because they've got so many ideas already even just a, a you know a, even just a two year old has already got these ideas about about the permanence of objects about the contiguity of objects about the causal relationships about what will happen if I push it this way or push it that way um, you know they have those um, uh, all of that already in place and we've got we've had philosophers for centuries sort of debating over um, how much of that can be acquired through mere experience or how much does the mind or the structure of reason in Kant's case bring to experience to give it shape um, and to uh, formulate or construct uh, the world out of the, the noisy raw data that it gets. Um, very old debate, and uh, famously we've got some answers here from uh, Hume, Hume argued that causal knowledge arises a posteriori uh, from custom or habit just by association, so he sounds more like one of these uh, modern computer scientists like Lacan. Um, and Kant argued that causal knowledge is enabled by a priori forms of intuition that are built into the mind, space and time in the categories. So Kant famously uh, reacted to Hume and said, no, a lot of this stuff has to be built in. Well, that debate from the 1700s is now being played out um, in seminars in graduate programs in computer science with people arguing over how to build AI systems. I mean, that's how important and relevant these, con these philosophical concepts are uh, right now. Uh, okay, a couple more things. Then, uh, just to wrap it up, uh, there's my list. We've got GoFi systems and properties and characteristics and a bunch of important concepts that I'm going to expect you to understand and be able to explain and describe. Um, so there's a long list on the left. And then the new wave uh, modern AI ANN systems have got all these different properties. And as a result, um, we're seeing them some sort of philosophically diff uh, philosophically significant capacities are emerging out of uh, connectionist systems in virtue of their mimicking some of these uh, neural features in uh, uh, organic neural nets.